we are trying to at our office get more information out to our clients um, i don't know if like we've been doing more stuff with bigger pockets that the large real estate blog um, and then at our office we're going to be rolling out a bunch of different things too just so investors are informed about what's going on in our local market because a lot of stuff online is like nationwide and different trends which is great but it doesn't really do us a lot of good uh, because every market's so specific. So um, starting, I think it's gonna be the end of August, we're just getting everything, all our teams put together. We're gonna be just doing a monthly update of what's going on, what's the trend, because as things transition, you gotta be flexible and move around. And so just staying on top of that information is really key. So you guys, we're gonna get going because we got a lot of stuff to cover. Um, and then what we're gonna do is I'm gonna go through this presentation. We're gonna talk about market trends, what's going on right now. And then we're just gonna open it for questions. Look inside the office, online. Uh, sometimes questions are the best way to get answers. Or, yes, that wasn't. Write it down. <laughs> take notes on this. <laughs> so it's just, the reason I like having questions is because people ask it from different ways. It expands the conversation and we can kind of get going from there. Um, all right, so we are gonna cover the first half of the market and the second half, because they are appearing to look a lot different. Um, so we're gonna kind of jump right into this. Um, who I am, for those online, obviously a lot of the people in the office already know. Um, we've been at our office, me and Will have been investing together since 2006. We have been in all different types of markets. Transitioning markets are not new to us. That's the life of real estate. Um, when we got in the market in 2005 and six, the market was red hot like it is, was or is now. Um, it was not quite as aggressive as what happened recently, but it was almost that way. It was very, very competitive. We were having to pay tons of money for deals, very tight margins just to keep things going through. And then in 2008, the market crashed. Um, and at that time, we be, kind of became the recession flippers and investors because what happened in 2008 is everybody quit investing. We opened up our off-market shop, we started getting some deals, and then all of a sudden subprime mortgages collapsed and no one was there to buy them. And so what we did is we lined up financing and we started flipping houses when no one really was flipping houses. Um, and we flipped through 2008 to 2010, which were really the shittiest years, uh, we flipped over 75 houses, which was kind of unheard of at the time. And, and we were able to sell our properties in 30 to 45 days, whereas the average market time back then was nine months. And so it's about putting the right strategy on things, prepping, getting the deal underwritten correctly, um, and then putting it into the market. So again, you guys, the market times back then were like, Eight, we used to run our hold times at 12 months for every deal. Even if it was like a condo, it'd be like, all right, this one's 10 months because we had to factor so much time to be on market. Um, we have flipped over a thousand homes. We own 2000 doors in the local market. So we are just active investors. And just so everyone knows in this, this office, we don't sell anything that we don't buy ourselves. Um, we don't sell any concepts. That's why we don't sell the Airbnb. We don't really do it in house. So we don't sell that. We only sell what we do because we want to make sure that we can give people good advice on how to execute the right plan. Uh, uh, since founding Heat and Dinner, we've done over 3,500 transactions, whether it was a good market, okay market, or a shitty market, we can get deals done. Um, and then we've done over a billion in sales with investors. Uh, so tonight what we're going to cover is we're going to cover the first half of 2022, which is probably the most unreal real estate market I've ever seen. Um, the interest rate impact of what's going on currently and where that's going to kind of go. What we have here is the, inter the interest rate impacts, what's, gonna ha what's, what's happened so far, what that could look like going forward, current market conditions, and the, for uh, the forecast for the second half, which is probably the most important thing, like what do we see in the trends, what do we think is gonna happen, uh, and then how to safely invest for the remainder of the year uh, if people choose to do so. All right, so the market, first thing we wanna do is kind of dig into what happened the first half. So that's kind of why we're seeing a little bit of a slowdown right now too. So first half of 2022 was pretty unreal. So King County medium home price jumped up to almost 900,000. Okay, and in 2018, it was 640,000. So that's a massive amount of appreciation in a very short amount of time. There's a 35% appreciation on the median home price and that covers all counties of King County. In May 2022, King, uh, King, so in May alone, King County rose 13.8% alone. 
And that's where we saw this massive hockey stick. Any comps from April, May were at these new pinnacle levels. I think even Vlad broke the market in Bothell. He sold a house in Bothell for 1.5 million and now they're selling for 1.1 million. So he just broke, it just was one of those houses that broke the market. Um, he also broke his budget at the same time. So <laughs> they go hand in hand. Um, and then Snohomish County median home price was at 780,000. In May 2022, Snohomish home prices rose up 20% in Snohomish County. So in one month, the market went up 20%. And in Pierce County, I skipped that one, uh, the, the prices went up 15%. Okay, so that is a massive amount of appreciation. Remember, the historical appreciation over the lifetime of real estate is 3.5% per year. And we were seeing 15 to 20% in one month. Um, and that's kind of where we saw this massive hockey stick. Uh, during that time too, average days on market across all counties was five days. Percentage over list on average was 7.8% in all three counties that they sold for above their list price at that time. And then inventory, less than two weeks, uh, inventory was less than two weeks per county. Okay. Does everyone understand what inventory, why that's so important? So the inventory, the lower the inventory, the higher the appreciation. And so there's this middle mark, and we'll talk about it in a second, is the, the actual, the, the leveling off plane is at five months of inventory, where you see no growth in your assets when there's about five months of inventory. Once it jumps above six, it starts declining. Once it gets below five, it starts increasing. So that's the magic number for, for appreciation and depreciation. Um, so that's why we had such a massive amount of appreciation. There was no homes for sale, rates were at an all-time low, and it turned into a massive frenzy. So our current state, um, and that, hey Naomi, will someone just monitor in the back to make sure the questions aren't saying it, they can't hear us? Okay, perfect. Uh, I just wanna make sure everyone can hear online. Um, so the current uh, market conditions for Washington State, and you guys, this is very similar for across the nation too, for everybody that's online. Uh, in the Pacific, we're focused on the Pacific Northwest because that's where our clients are. Uh, the current market conditions in Washington. So in the last 12 weeks, inventory has increased 22%. Okay, that is a massive jump. But the one thing is, we're talking about 22% of two weeks. So it's not, it is a massive amount of homes coming up that they've been used to seeing, but we're still not even close to that five months of inventory right now. Um, and then numbers of sales are down 11.4% in the last three week, uh, uh, 12 weeks. Days on market have increased to 20 days. And on average across the whole state, that's up 33%. So what that means is it takes longer to sell a house. Two weeks is not a really, or five days is not a very reasonable time frame in itself. So now we're starting to see, we're basically seeing the market start to normalize back out. Um, and then percentage over list for April, what we were seeing, and this is a kind of an important stat too, is in April, we were seeing across statewide, 4% of all homes were getting bid up over. Currently right now, that has averaged out to 0%. So that's why we're not seeing multiple offers on very many homes, right? Some are selling a little bit under list, some are still selling a little bit above list, and it's leveled out to 0% currently. Um, so we're gonna dig into our three counties that we really focus on, King County. So one thing to look at, inventory is up 13.74% up in King County. Numbers of sales have decreased by 18.4. So that's a bigger drop off than the statewide. Um, and then days on market are up 70% since the last 12 weeks in King County. Uh, so, but again, it's not a big number. 10 days to 17 days is now the average. So that's why you'll see 70% look so big, but it's still a very low time. Historically, guys, it takes about three and a half months to sell a house. So for the lifetime of real estate, three and a half months is a normal time frame. So 17 days, we're actually still doing very, very well at that point. And then percentage over list from April. So in April, in King County, they were selling for over 10, oh, about 10% 10 over list, which is a huge number if you think about it. That's where we saw that massive appreciation. Now it's gone down to zero. So what interest rates have done is it's dragged down the market or the, the, the velocity of the market, right? Slowing things down. Pierce County inventory was up 13.74%. Numbers of sales decreased to 18.4. Oh, and the one thing I skipped right over though, 
Let's go back. One thing I do want to point out, median home sale prices though, are down 5.93%. So what we've seen, and if you really think about it, in, in April, where we were talking about, it saw 10% appreciation. So we've seen a 5.9% pullback off of that peak pricing. If April was the highest month, which it appears to be, April and the recording day of May, we still are selling at half of what the peak is at that point. So we're still above technically April numbers for the comparables. So Pierce County, inventory's up 13.74%. Uh, number of sales have decreased by 18%. Days on market have increased 27%. So in the last 12 weeks, they've gone from selling in 18 days to 23 because we started seeing affordability issues in April anyways with Pierce County to where it started, the days on market started kind of clicking up a little bit. And so it, 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 uh, it started dragging up and now in the last 12 weeks, it's gone up the 27%. And then again, in April, they were actually also plus 9%. They're not down to flat zero. So we're not seeing a lot of multiple offers. But the one stat that you wanna look at is even with more increased inventory, longer days on market, is still appreciated at 1.26%. So just because things are taking longer to sell in some markets doesn't mean that it's going down. It's just taking longer to sell because people now have choices. Um, Oh yeah, this one, this one got cut off a little bit. Um, so Snohomish County inventory is up 17.76%. Uh, number of sales have decreased by 17%. Days on market are up 28%. They've gone from 14 days to 18. And then percentage over list April. So in April, it was up 11%. Now it's down to zero. What this number is right here is, a, is at 8.39% in Snohomish County. So Snohomish County's actually been brought down the furthest, the quickest. The reason being, it also appreciated the fastest in April. It got the highest amount of comps, got the highest appreciation, so it's seen the equal amount of pullback because it's about 50% of what this was, which is same as King County, so we're just seeing a pullback off peak. Um, so now that we talked about what's kind of happening currently, right? So what, what have we seen? We saw in April, rates were extremely low, inventory is low, high appreciation for the two months. April, it was basically February, Mar March, April, May were record months. Now what we've seen is we're seeing a pullback. And like we saw in Pierce County, it's still staying pretty even across the board. Snohomish County's pulling back a little bit faster just because it went up faster during, during the spring. King County's Again, starting to pull back because it also jumped up faster. So let's talk about why is it reducing down. So the things that investors want to pay attention to, the one thing that I always have regrets on in 2008 was I didn't pay attention to what was going on around me. I was in real estate. All I knew was a really hot market. I've been flipping properties. I've been wholesaling properties and everything was perfect all the time. And so I had no other reason really to look outside. I was like, okay, well, real estate's awesome. We got Microsoft here, we got Boeing here. It's perfect. But that doesn't mean anything because you have to pay attention on what's going on around you. So as investors, what you guys, what I tell everyone to do is, is start, like, start listening to what's going on around you, right? That's gonna tell you how to buy, where you should be comfortable in your buy boxes and what's going on with the economy. So what drives real estate? Cost of money and the economy. It's not just that people need housing because they can rent. It's not that, you know, or in Seattle they can get a tent. Um, and it's, but it, it has to do with the economy, right? And so what we are entering into or what they're predicting is we're going into a bear market. That means our economy is going into a recession. That's okay. We just change how we do and how we buy. So what's going on, what, uh, what are they forecasting for real estate? So what a lot of, professionals are anticipating is about a 10% decline off peak pricing uh, by the end of the, the year. We're already starting to see it like in certain markets, right? Pierce County's still kind of flat, King County's down five, Snohomish County's already there. But what they're saying is around 10% uh, decline off the median home price, not just the peak price. And so we're seeing a pullback. The reason being is cost of money's a lot more, and we'll look at that in a second. They're also thinking that transactions are gonna drastically decline over the next 
remainder part of the year. The reason being, again, once the, the consumers get a little bit of fear and there's unknown going on, which there is, people slow down on their decision making. They get stalled out, they sit on the bench. That means people aren't gonna be buying. That doesn't mean that not everyone's gonna be buying, but there's gonna be a lot more limited of a pool. And then what the US economy is forecasting is, I think everybody just is now predicting that a recession's fairly likely. You know, I think about three months ago when we were all listening to the Fed, they were saying, hey, we think this can be a soft landing, everything's gonna be okay. And then all of a sudden inflation kept going up and they've changed their tune because of how they've had to react to inflation is gonna, it, they're taking steps to put, basically put us into a recession. Uh, we're most likely going into a bear market. And then the thing that we all have to pay attention to is that inflation rate. They, the, how they control inflation is cost of money. Cost of money, it, the more expensive money is, the faster everything slows down including business growth, uh, it's gonna affect tech growth for, for hiring, it's gonna affect housing costs, it's gonna affect, it's also gonna affect construction in a good way, where we should be able to get good pricing, but it's just gonna put us more into kind of a, a flatter market, which makes it a more logical market as well. And then what they're also anticipating is increased unemployment, okay? They actually want to increase unemployment right now. The reason being is last time we saw this kind of inflation, it was in 1971, is because unemployment was at 0%. They had done a bunch of funding, they, got it, they, they printed almost the same amount of money. I think John was selling real estate during that time. Almost. Almost. Uh, <laughs> John, John's giving us the 70s tips. Uh, and so what they had to do was they had to, you know, because they got to zero unemployment, everyone, the labor market got all screwed up and no one was working. What does that sound like right now? They thought it would be a good thing and it turned out to be a really bad thing, right? And so that's kind of what we're having. So the reason they're, they're predicting a forecast and a recession is because they're trying to reset the labor market. Um, and so we're probably going to get there. As real estate investors, what does that mean? That means there's better opportunities out there. And we'll talk about that more in a second. That's, I mean, again, you guys, that's how me and Will built our whole portfolio was not during a time where people wanted to buy real estate. It's, you know, when you want to buy when everyone else wants to buy, well then sure, yeah, it's going to go okay for a certain amount of time, but you want to buy when people are not buying. Um, so inflation forecast. So in 2022, and this is really important guys, because this is really what's driving, there's two things driving interest rates right now. There's the labor market, and then there's inflation. Right now, labor market's too expensive. People don't wanna to go to work. It's a major problem. I think we all have seen that in our job sites. Like trying to get people to show up is a nightmare right now. The second thing is uh, the cost of goods. They were blaming it all on supply chain, which is definitely a portion, but it's also because we probably printed too much money and stuck in the market. Now what they have to do is really, they, they have to increase the cost to get that, so we can get our dollar back up and make it more valuable. It's actually the right call. So they have to do these things or we're gonna be in deep trouble in 12 months. But in 2022, so when we were looking at deals, they were, uh, we saw in January that the inflation went up to seven and a half percent. So as investment brokers and a team, we're going off of what they report, right? We saw that inflation was at an all time high. But then the Fed came out two months later and they said, this is okay. We're still gonna go with our rate hikes at this time. This is when they rolled out their six hikes and they said it was gonna be two half point hikes and, and, and four quarter point hikes. And so as you're buying and you're looking at deals, there's no, because that's what's really gonna dictate, is gonna really dictate how aggressive you're gonna be on your offers. That's where this reporting then all of a sudden went really bad. Because in May, inflation got reported at 8.6%. And what that meant is they had already increased rates by that time, and they'd increased the cost of money and inflation kept going up. That is a major problem. And so that's why we've seen the Fed switch their tune to go, hey, now we're going to three quarters and three quarters, and maybe even another three quarter after that. Because their two half point hikes did zero impact on inflation. Um, so what the Fed is predicting that we're going to end at, because right now we're at 8.7 is what it is. They are predicting though with these rate hikes that inflation is going to get back down to 5% by the end of the year. Or that's what he said, at least on June 15th. If that is correct, that's when rates are going to start falling down at that point. 
I don't know if that's correct or not, but we need it to get down to about three to 5% so rates can get back down to 5%, yeah, I would say four to 5% at that point. So uh, this is something that you really wanna pay attention to in your forecasting, right? So like as you're looking at deals, we're gonna come up with our own underwriting, or as you're looking at properties, if you have, like for me, I have a lot of really long projects, ones that I can't fix in six weeks, impossible. I got at least five months on a couple of them. We have new development sites that we bought. Those are at least 12 months out. So for us, why we're paying attention to this is that the, if the inflation doesn't calm down, we're gonna switch our game plan up on some of these. Like on our townhomes, we might scale back our finishes, get our costs down lower, make it more affordable. On our flips, on our longer ones, well, those are really big projects, so we're actually gonna double down and spend more money because we want it to be nicer just to get it moved correctly. But as you're in projects, there's certain benchmarks that you can stop and look at it and go, can I change my plan at this point? Can I cut costs down? Where should we be? And that's why you wanna pay attention to all these numbers, right? Because if I'm looking at, hey, if inflation really does look like it's gonna get down to 5%, then the market's not gonna go much further down than it's gonna get down by September because rates are gonna start normalizing at that point. The contradictory information is the Fed also said that rates could be at 4% from the Fed by the middle of next year. So I don't know if that's a, a correct predict, uh, prediction. So let's look at interest rates. So how are they controlling this inflation? So current interest rates are, um, we've seen on the, on the residential side, a, a two and a half to 3% increase over the last 90 days. That is the largest interest rate increase we've seen since 1982. It actually stomps all over 1982. Um, this has affected people's mortgage payments by 35 to 40% when they're buying a house. That's a huge expense, especially when inflation is ripping and they're already losing eight and a half to 9% a year. And so that's why we're starting to see the market slow down quite a bit. Um, and these are much higher increases on the rates than anybody was expecting. Because as investors, we go off of what the Fed's gonna tell us they're gonna do. They basically doubled what they were planning on doing uh, back in, in February. Uh, 2022 forecast, uh, in the June Fed meeting, they said that there is gonna be three more increases by the end of 2022. So right now, we're gonna see three more increases. Rates are, I think, for owner-occupied right now, are about six and a quarter. For investors, they're 8%, percent seven half to 8%, so they're substantially higher. Um, that last increase is already factored for in these rates. In addition to, they're saying in July, there's gonna be another increase of another three quarter point hike, not a quarter, they're doing three quarter. Or that's what he basically said. Uh, I would bank on that. Um, I think he's still saying maybe half point. I would bank on the, the three quarter because the, the inflation number is going to be bad at the end of the month. Um, but the banks, you guys, as when the, every time the Fed talks, they're already getting the jump on everybody. So right now, because the Fed rate is at 1.76% and rates are at 6%. That's, that's almost a 4% jump. That's, you know, 4.25%. Typically, it's about two to three points. So as you can see, the banks have already jump, got a jump on that. So rates aren't gonna spike up again in June because they're, they're kind of in there. Now, based on what the Fed says and, and, and how peace of mind they are, or you know, how well inflation is being controlled, that's where the banks will either get another jump on it or settle it down a little bit. So, um, Again, this July rate increase is kind of already in the numbers. So if you've got flips going on right now, it's probably going to not make a huge, huge impact on what today's numbers are trading at. Um, and then what the Fed did say, and this is concerning to me, is that the federal rate, again, we're at 1.67 right now, or 1.76. They're saying it could be at four points by middle of 2022. And at four points, that's gonna put the residential rates about seven and a half to eight and a half percent. Um, and so once the banks kind of think that they're, because what's gonna happen is the banks will jump ahead a little bit more and then they'll settle it back down. Uh, Cause I do think that the banks learned a lot of lessons in 2008 and they decided they won't ever be in that situation again. Um, so why is there such a rapid change? The rapid change is because inflation is at an all-time high, 8.6%. The labor market, like we all know, people are not showing up. They're asking for too much wages. I mean, who's had their demo costs go up like four times what it should be? And that is not a skilled labor job. 
Not, nothing is demo, guys, if you're on there, but a lot of what, it's, it's just not, you know? So all these things are stopping to make sense. So the good news is, is because the government in the Fed is stepping in, it's gonna normalize our whole market as, as investors and level things out. Um, the other reason that they're doing it is general asset inflation. And then the one concern I do have is when he ended that last talk, the Fed, he did say, it's time for the real estate market to be reset, reset, which is not a good statement, but it's something you want to pay attention to. So who actually listens to his speeches when he talks, or do you just get the highlights? I would encourage everybody to listen to the full speech. Don't just take the clips. I stop what I'm doing and I make sure to listen to him. That is going to dictate your whole business. So all, like if he's talking, get on and listen. He's gonna give you hints. He's gonna get you to, like different things in there. Um, and it's really gonna help you guys with how you wanna be investors going down the road. Um, so let's look at how that looks on the math on display. So in uh, January, with rates being around 3.25%, if you bought a house or you had a loan for a million dollars, your payment would have been $4,300 a month. In today's market at 6%, it's now 6,000. So that's a $1,700 increase on the same property at that point. That would put the new net price about $1.2 million on this house. So someone buying a house today for a million bucks is really paying one, two back in, in December. And that's why we're seeing things pull back. Um, rental properties one to four on a million dollars. Rates were about 4.25. The payment was 49,119. Now they're at 63,53. So multifamily is actually getting hammered more if you're in the middle of a burn right now uh, because just rates are just skyrocketing for investors. You can buy your rate down. Um, it costs about a point to two to get it kind of down a little bit as an investor. But that's what's causing the stall out in, in the longer market times, just an affordability issue. Um, so when are we gonna see interest rates lower, right? Because that's gonna make all of our lives easier. Uh, when inflation starts to decline, that's the number one thing. We have to get inflation rate at about four to 5%. Um, labor market needs to come back alive. Or, you know, people are coming back to jobs. I mean, one thing I have noticed with these interest rates, we have job openings. We've had openings for months and months and getting no resumes, and the resumes are definitely start coming in a lot more right now. I've also had, is anyone being called by contractors already? Not yet. Oh, I've been getting guys calling me like, hey, checking in, if you have any work, right? Because as things slow down, it creates more opportunity, right? So it's not all bad. And then also they need to uh, fix the supply chain pressures, right? There's still lots of things that we need as investors that cost more right now because they don't have it. And that is gonna make a big impact on our pricing. Um, so they are, one tip I kind of got from that last meeting, the Fed is anticipating us to get through the, the rough, rough part of this by like the third to fourth quarter of 2023. Right, so as investors, what I'm all, and the reason that's such an important stat for me is timing is everything in real estate. So if I can buy during a crappy part when people don't really wanna buy, and I can time it when it starts ramping back up, that's what we did in 2010 to 12. Everything that we bought in 2009 and 10 all of a sudden doubled in value in an 18 month period. And we were able to 1031 it off, sell it off, upgrade our portfolio, and we went from what, 11 houses to 2,000 doors? all about buying right with the right equity positions, timing it, and then trading at that point. So uh, what we are gonna see though, after all this, right? So we know that the economy is a little bit of hot water, cost of money was too cheap, a hockey stick or market, now things are starting to slow down as things kind of increase, thanks bud. Uh, and now what are we seeing on the impacts? As we all know, like who's got a house on the market right now? It's slower, right? Yeah, it's, it's just slow. And it's right next to Rustin. It's like cookie cutter, Tacoma, 2,100 square foot, four bedroom, two bath. Has like everything anybody can want. Quarter lot across from the street from the park. Yeah, so good product is sitting, yeah. right? And then, so we are definitely going to see longer market times. You guys, two weeks was not re reasonable. Or five days. Not normal. For you to put your house on th 
Thursday, get 40 offers and have it pending by Tuesday, not normal. If what's also not normal is no one coming to see something, right? And that's where you got to track that. That, that it, the, the biggest thing is just communicating with your broker teams right now is talking, who's the other listings? What's their action? Are they getting showings? If they're not getting showings, is it maybe you just wait? If they're getting more showings, then it could be a pricing issue. Um, and, but we just need to anticipate longer market times, right? And so what, like what we're gonna be doing, we'll talk about this more in a second, is we're increasing our performa calcs. Because it's not just about how long is it gonna to take to fix, sell, because we used to do that back, all right, it's gonna be four weeks to fix it, or four months, five months to fix it. It's gonna be another 45 days on market, and that's how we come up with our, our anticipated hold times. Because it was put in the yard, be sold in seven days, and then you got a 30 day close. And so we'd always put 45 days on. Now what we're gonna be doing is putting more of like a 60 to 90 day anticipation, where you might have 30 days on market with a 30 day close, or maybe a 40, you know, 45 days on market with a 45 day close. Um, one of the things that we are really seeing from this, and this is what's hurting the market most, is irrational price drops. I am seeing properties listed for normal pricing and, it, and listing brokers and their sellers are dropping their price like 15% after six days. So we'll see like a $150,000 price drop on a house that would appear to be, me and John were comping out some houses in Bellevue today. And there was, there was one that was, it was bizarre. It was like a fixed up house was pending at a lower price than two that just sold that weren't fixed up because they cut the price or priced it low on purpose because they thought they were gonna get multiples, but they didn't get multiples. And so like what is really actually hurting the market, and I don't wanna say this in a bad way, but just really inexperienced brokers. You gotta remember that 60% of the workforce in real estate is pretty new to real estate. They've never seen anything but this market. That means they don't know shit about real estate, I'm sorry. If you've only worked in this market for two years, you have got a lot to learn. Because you don't know, real estate goes up and down. Like it's like if you, if you talk to a stockbroker or a more uh, wealth advisor, a new wealth advisor is gonna be like, the stock market's great. It goes up and you make 10 to 15% on your money. It's amazing, right? Who cares about a recession? I was talking to a guy the other day. He's like, it's gonna keep going 25%, 20. And I'm like, this guy does not know what the fuck he's talking about. <laughs> but then you talk to guys that have been doing it a long time. It's like, no, no, it's patience. This is gonna go down. You gotta sit here, you hold tight. Like they, they know what the cycles are, right? Problem is 60% of the staff out there right now, real estate became really easy for people to make money in. And so who's working right now doesn't understand it. And then their sellers are getting FOMO and they're making bad price drops, which is bad for us, right? Because all of a sudden we're getting undercut by the whole market. Um, and they're kind of like trying to stick the sale before without logic. We're also seeing very selective buyers right now. People, and you know what, good for them. People were buying million dollar homes on a whim that they hadn't ever even been in. And they were just flinging no inspection. I mean, that sucks for them too, right? Like that's not a good way to buy a house. But so now they're getting more time, right? They can go, okay, does this work for me? Is it walkable? All these things. And we're seeing that in our showing feedback because a lot of what we get is, oh, we love the house. They liked everything about it, but we're gonna go look at five more houses. Because there is that inventory's increase and they're just taking their time. The other thing is they're spending more money on their mortgage right now. It costs them a lot more money today than it did four months ago, so they're gonna slow down their decision making. And then one thing that we've seen on our showings is showings have dropped 90% in the last 90 days. We're still selling properties, but our showings are way down. And so that's what you just have to anticipate as an investor, right? It's not the same as what it was 90 days ago, and that's okay. We just gotta make sure we price it right, stick with our plan, and then make adjustments that we need to make with the uh, the market. So how do you pivot in something like this, right? Because we've gone from this hockey stick that went through the roof to all of a sudden it's starting to come down, could flatten out, could keep dropping in a couple different sectors. Um, and just so you guys know, we've seen that 5% drop like in King County, but certain markets, you know, like Chris just listed a property and we got really good showings and really good feedback for a price that was the same price that it would have been 90 days ago in my opinion. I think that's probably in the higher end of the, the comps at that point. Yeah, it is. But we had really good feedback, really good traction that is all workable leads for our broker. And, and they're working on them. 
So not all markets are different. Or Jennifer Hafner listed a property in Gay Harbor for 800,000. And I was like, ooh, this is gonna be a big number with being in Gay Harbor, how money cost, and it got bit up by like 10%. 835. Oh, 835. Yeah, so it went up basically 5%. So like those, and that was one I was anticipating to actually sell a little under on. So it's just a little bit irrational at that point. Um, but so how do you make that, so not every housing is going through some corrections right now. So how do you pivot? You gotta educate yourself. Again, you guys, look at what's going wrong. L listen to what people are saying, right? Like the Fed is telling us the truth. He's told us exactly what he's gonna go do. So then you have to adjust your, how you buy right now. Um, reduce debt costs is what I, you know, I know I'm a firm believer of this. Like if you have a property and you get it done, or let's say you buy a cosmetic deal. I know we just sold a cosmetic deal in Kirkland, the market started shifting, and the investor goes, you know what, I'm gonna wait for a second, and he refied it right away. Because now his rate went from 10%, 10 to 12%, down to 5.5%. Or no, he, it was an investment, so he's at 7.5% at that point. But he cut his debt cost down, because he could do it with that specific product. Not all, like there's not any chance any of my houses could be refied right away. But some houses do work that way. So look how you can reduce your costs. If you have a house that's getting finished and you can talk to a mortgage company or you can get the debt cost down and you're gonna have 60 days on market and you can refi it and cut your rate down, do that. That's just a way to get more money in the deal by, by putting the right financing on it. You wanna evaluate your scope of work right now. So our listing brokers, you guys, and our acquisition brokers, we know scopes of work, we know comparables, we know how to put the right plan in place. If you have a deal, you just bought it, or you're already in the middle of it, that's where you wanna tag these guys and say, hey, let's all look at this together as a team, you know, because I, I look at all the deals with them as well, and we go, How, can we make any changes or not? Sometimes you can't make any changes, but sometimes there is. There might be in cases where we tell you to spend more money, or we're gonna tell you to spend less money. You know, um, I know Zach scaled back his house in, in, in Woodinville a little bit. And I'm scaling back a couple of mine right now too. And then I'm also increasing some other ones, right? So don't just stick with your original scope of work. Scope of work's made for when you bought it. You're also supposed to change it if th something changes in your metrics, right? Like if I go buy a stock and I think it's gonna go through the roof and all of a sudden it starts declining, I might sell it right away, right? Or like I might change that plan or what I'm doing in my stock portfolio at the time. I don't just go, well, this was my plan, I'm sticking with it. Like, or let's say I go buy Amazon or Facebook and then all of a sudden all that information about Apple comes out. Or no, actually the best example is Tesla. I shorted Tesla, then I heard information that they were gonna split. And I knew this was coming. And I was like, well, okay, whatever. I still think it's over, I, think, I still think it's overinflated, so whatever. Got my ass whooped because I didn't do anything different, right? What I should have done is sold it, wait for it to shoot back up and then shorted it again but I didn't make any changes what I easily could have. It would have took me a click of the button and in my brain I was like, maybe you wanna look at that. And I just didn't. And so same thing, right? You wanna be paying attention. Evaluate your scope of work. Communicate with your resources. You guys, what we're doing right now when we're talking contractors, I'm stalling them out. I'm going, hey look, with your costs right now, you know, they all hear what's going on with housing. These guys also work for builders and other investors. They're also being told, I'm gonna to take a break right now for a second. That means their they're, I'm so busy is gonna shrink down. Start communicating with these guys. Say, hey look, you know, if you can get your pricing back down, I'm gonna still keep buying, but, or whatever it is, I got a bunch of projects in the work, but I need you to help me out here. The market's not what it was anymore. And they're pretty open. Like they've been charging you guys way too much or a lot more because they can, right? They see your houses sell for a lot of money. They hear what's going on. We are making more money. They're gonna make more money too. Good for them, they should. But you also gotta communicate with them. Like we've been talking to guys, so I'm like, hey dude, look, if you're gonna be at this, I was talking to my HVAC guy the other day, I'm like, dude, I can't pay you nine grand for two mini splits. I was like, we'll just go baseboard heat, forget it. I don't, I don't care. <laughs> it's just like, he's like, well, what do you mean? It's like, well, that's just what it is now. And you know, so it starts grinding down. Talk to your resources. Um, and then price off current market trends, you guys. We all have a performa on all of our deals. Some of them are still hitting performa, some are still hitting above depending on when you bought. A lot of what we've seen is majority of our properties are still hitting the performa numbers. There's only certain markets getting pulled back and it's like if someone used Vlad's comp and bought, I'm gonna go back to that one again, that's where people are in trouble, right? And so it's, 
you know, because we're, we're staying, like a lot of our properties have been able to sell, you know, they're, they're not selling for what we listed them for, but they're still selling above Performa. It, does that make sense? Because we're still above that number. And so investors are like, well, I'm making less money. I'm like, no, you're not making less money. This the appreciation of evaporated real quick and you're still hitting your number. Um, and then be patient. Don't get nervous seller antsy. Talk to your brokers, talk to who you're working with. Do they think, you, get, get their recommendations. Find out what's going on. You know, because your house doesn't sell in the first weekend, you have one showing. If every other house in that block only had one showing, that's okay. Then we're all still priced right. If every house had six showings and yours had zero or one, then you might be priced a little heavy. So just communicate, communicate, be patient. All right, so what we're gonna talk about now is the investment strategy. Um, we're gonna go through this, and then what we're gonna do is we're gonna open it up for questions for everybody online and then in uh, the office as well. But, uh, so with all this information, what do you do? Because what, you, what I do know is you guys can't do what you've been doing. And I can't do what I've been doing. I have to change my business at this point. That's the one thing about being an investor. You change how you do business. Like Stephanie has been buying with us for a long time. Do you do your projects the same way you did them five years ago? No. Completely different, right? You definitely do them a lot nicer now. <laughs> so do I. So it's, uh, you know, it's, Tori I think's kept with the same plan for, since, since day one. But it's, you guys, you have to change, right? When the market changes, you have to change with it. And if you don't change, you're gonna get yourself in a heap of trouble. And so, um, so, Currently what we're doing with all of our underwriting, just we wanna make sure everyone knows, is comp trends. We are, uh, or things that you guys need to do with your projects is A, you guys, we are a reliable resource for you guys. We have Ryan, our client service manager, he will go find contractors. If you guys don't know, Ryan has been psycho stalking people <laughs> at, like he literally sits in front of Pius for nine, 10 hours a day. Any contractor that goes in there, he goes and talks to them, interviews them, gets their information, goes drive sites. Plumbing supply, we're hanging out at all the places they go to. That's what, that's what I came down to and we're tracking people's permits. So use Ryan, right? Use your listing brokers. Um, communicate with your listing team, you guys. These are the people, or if you're, you're renting out your house, your leasing team. These are the people handling the disposition for you. They are the ones with the information that you need to hear. Okay, so like what we're doing is on every active listing, we are tracking, we are calling and talking to on a weekly basis as brokers. If the house is within a quarter to half mile, we are on the phone with them every Monday going, hey, how's your showings? How's your, are you getting any offers? Where, if you did get offers, where were they at? Because we just need to know what the information is. The pendings and solds don't always tell the whole story, but the people selling will tell us the story. We're getting showing activity. That is the biggest thing that we're really looking at. We're tracking supplies and inventory in each market, like what's going on and where, is it getting to a dangerous level? And then how many people are coming through and is that on par with everybody else? Um, and then also the things that you wanna communicate really well with the brokers. You guys, at any time, we can recomp houses, look at properties, go tour them with you guys, and then we can look at the finished packages of what's going on. Because I have seen recently in the data points that people scaling back like people are opting for cleaner houses with a little bit less finishes that are priced lower than the premium. It has definitely been a little, but not in all cases too. It just kind of depends if it's on the upper echelon of the price point. Again, like going back to Bellevue, I was looking at a couple, I'm like, okay, so those sold for one, two, five, and this one sold for one, three, and this one has 200 grand more in upgrades. So people are chasing that affordability factor at that point. Um, so finished packages, again, you guys, that's your doors, your flooring, your tile, whether you're gonna put tile in the back, like where can you cut things back? You guys, there's so many, the hard part is for the last two years, we could spend as much money as we want on these things and they were gonna sell and we we're gonna sell them for a lot. And so it was very easy to be like, here, here's more money here, this is cool, I like this, let's, let's make it look like this. That is not how we're supposed to be doing it, guys. We're supposed to go, this is what the comp is, this is what we need to do, do that plan. And so that, using these comps, you know, especially on the pendings too, like we might, you know, if we're looking at flooring and I'm seeing laminate floor and I can tell right away, we're gonna tell you guys to put in $2 floors, not $3.50 floors. Or if they have an upgraded kitchen, we're gonna tell you to upgrade that kitchen. So really use that. Our brokers are totally trained in this, you guys. The acquisition guys and our listing brokers. 
So when they're on site with you, have them, they can bring comparables, you guys can go through the photos together and dig in. Um, spec design, contact your listing broker about changing specs if needed. If you need help with that, that's what we're here to do. We have tons of resources in there that will go pound the phones and figure out resources for you guys. And then uh, execute the plan. I don't know what that means, spend time reducing. Oh, this is uh, things that, what we're, what we're gonna be start pitching in our packages, there's a reduced scope of work. Because what we, again, what we're seeing in the trends is people want affordable and they're willing to take a little bit of hair on a house rather than going and buying the, the totally dialed in ones. Um, and you guys, that's really, again, I wanna to touch base on that. That's for like the markets that were just peaks to these numbers that we've never seen before. Like when we were seeing homes in Lake Hills sell for 1.7 million that were 1,400 square feet, that's a lot of money for a 1,400 square foot house. Um, that's where we saw a little bit more of a pullback. But you can spend more time reducing your costs by just putting the right plan in place. And so by picking up those costs, you can pick up your margin that way. That's how we used to make money in 2008 to 12. It wasn't really that we were doing them a little bit nicer than everybody else, but we were just working our asses off to put the right plan in play and we would be able to shred their costs, everyone else's by like 35%. And that was our margin that we were making. We used to say we used to invent the return. There's no money, so we'll figure out a plan that can, you can make money with it. And that's really what an investor's job is. Put that puzzle, you have to solve the puzzle to make money, not just the market going way up. Uh, one thing I've heard, I get, get a lot of calls, should I wait this out? If you are super nervous and you don't have the stomach for this, then yes, you should wait it out. It's invest, you guys, we look at as investors, we've been making 30, 40, 50, 60, 150% returns on houses. That is an absorbently high return. That comes with a lot of risk. If it was that easy, anybody would do it. And so, when you are buying, in, when you have that much upside, you do have risk with it. And if, you, and if you don't have the stomach for risk, that's okay, but then you should sit it out at that point. Um, do I think that's the right call? Not for me personally, I'm not, I'm not that way because that's not, if I would have done that back in 2008, I would not be where I'm at today. That I can 100% tell you at that point. You know, and it always goes back to this quote by Warren Buffett, be fearful when others are greedy and greedy when others are fearful. So everybody and their mom tried to get into real estate in the last six to 12 months. I wanna buy it, I wanna buy it, I'm getting licensed, I got this loan, let me get inside. I'm seeing people make up returns with VRBOs and air, like all sorts of stuff. I'm like, you're buying this, or like they buy a house, and like, well I can rent it out, six different bedrooms. I'm like, this is not a good plan. Uh, it's, and so they were like almost inventing the return in the wrong ways, right? Because they were just getting greedy when it was, the market was hot. Now what happens though, as soon as there's a little bit of hair in the market, guess what happens? 70% of the investors leave the market. That is a good thing. That gives us more room. That gives us more time. That gives us, we can make more logical decisions at that point. We get better opportunities. We don't have to buy these slimmer margins. We can buy now at bigger margins uh, because the appreciation is not coming into play. So what you have to do though, before you decide to stay in the market is you need to narrow your buy box. You know, like for me, when people go, well, you still buy real estate right now? Because I have a lot, you guys, just so you guys know, I have more projects going than probably most. And I'm okay with what's going on right now. Because that's just the way it is. I also crushed the last year. So if I over crushed here, I might take a little bit of a hit here and it's gonna balance out to where I'm probably gonna be pretty happy with how I did in real estate over a four year basis. But what you need to do is, for you to know whether you're gonna sit out or not, what's your expected cash on cash return? There, in my opinion, you should never sit out from any deal if it hits a certain number. You, just some of us might have a lower number than others. So if you're looking at your next deal, as, a, if, as your investor, we know that there's risk in the market. Rate, rates are changing, appetite for real estate's changing. Uh, one thing we also know is there's still no housing, right? And so people still need to live places. So you know those are things that come into play. But what's your return? Like right now, we have, I know me and Will talked about this the other day, we have probably like 13 to $14 million worth of real estate we need to sell in the next 12 months. That's a lot, right? So if the market comes down 20%, that's a big number we're gonna take a hit on. But 
that doesn't mean we're going, okay, we're full. We're going, okay, well, what's the next buy? Because if those deals don't quite work out the way we might, they might not work out, then I'm gonna make sure my next pipeline is gonna offset that really quick. So, you know, what we had to do was put expected returns. What's our return on development sites that we're gonna buy? What's our return on syndication apartment buildings that we're gonna buy? What's our return on fix and flip that we're gonna buy? And as long as we have those numbers, we can make a very smart decision at that point. You wanna evaluate your resources. This is the time as you think, slow things down, you start resetting, evaluate who works for you and who doesn't work for you. We all have the contractors that are a little bit cheaper, but they take forever. Those are guys are bad, fire them. I fired all mine in the last 90 days. The reason being, they were good for me when the market's ripping up at an absorbent rate. I'm like, all right, well, you guys are cheap and you're taking longer, which is making me more money. Now it's the opposite. Cheap means bad quality work and it's taking too long, which I'm exposed to higher markets. Get rid of the cheap slow guys. Not unless they're dirt, dirt cheap. The problem is they're not as cheap as they used to be. Long-term uh, uh, long holding buy box. As investors, guys, flipping is great for income. The last two years have been great for income. It's been shitty for wealth. Buying a good long-term hold in the last two years that cash flows well, that has good upside, has been next to impossible. You'd be able to buy some stuff, you refi it, and you get, and then it was good if you got appreciation, but now if appreciation comes down, it's still a crappy rental at the end of the day. So it's been really hard. Like back when we would buy rentals, we used to buy everything with a de development side upside. Can we get another lot out of it? Does it zone L zoned? Buy it now when the market's not pressed out because when a market turns around, that's where it becomes gold again. And then you take that gold and you go trade it for a bigger pile of gold. And so, you know, really figure out what you want to keep and what you don't want to keep. You know, just because interest rates are high does not mean anything. That means you buy cheaper. That's all that means. If my interest rate is 8.5% on my rental property or it's 3% over here, I don't care. Is it making me the same cash flow? If it's making the same cash flow, it's the same number to me. Um, and then just get ready to pivot. How are you going to pivot? What kind of projects were you doing? Do you need to change the type of projects that you were that you were working on. For me, I used to flip tons of homes. We used to do like 100, 150 a year. Then as our brokers became bigger and our teams became bigger, and then as our clients started eating up all the deals, we started buying really big projects that were taking 12 to 18 months. I'm probably gonna get, I'm pivoting what I'm gonna be buying now. And I'm gonna be going back to base hit deals because I like getting in and out of deals. You can control your costs better. You just get your deal done, you move on to the next one. So pivot what you're doing. Maybe what you, you do like what you're doing. You guys, those big projects are also gonna come with huge margins. So maybe instead of doing five cosmetic flips, you do one big one. Or maybe instead of doing one big one, you do a bunch of turns. But you can kind of do that based on your, your buy box. And then make sure you pad the performa. And what does padding the performa means? So padding the performa for fix and flip. So what we're doing for us, right, and for a brokerage or me as a buyer. So you guys, when we sell properties at our office, it's what I would buy the property at. That's the return that is at my buy box. And I, I can guarantee that because we take all, all, we take the leftovers. We either take the ones that no one wants. If I pulled up my list of properties that I'm working on right now, 99% of our clients would not touch those properties because they're just huge. They're just complex, but uh, you know, for, so for, for us, we just have to, oh, I kind of forgot where I was going there. Um, it's, it, well, it's a matter of padding the, oh, so the, the returns. So padding the performance. So what we've done to, for fix and flip. So we have been selling properties about 12 to 14% on cash, which equated to about 30 to 35% with hard money, roughly on returns. Now what we're doing is we're underwriting everything at an 18 to 20% return. So we've padded our flip numbers to where it's more susceptible for a market downturn. That's all you wanna do is have a bigger walk-in margin. We're also throwing construction contingencies on our budgets now. We're gonna add another 10% to them. And just so you guys know, we've redone our budgets every 90 days. We increase them every 90 because it's just what's going on. And so our new costs are, we're gonna have an additional 10% on. Reason being, it gives you pad, gives you more room in your margin. In addition to, inflation is gonna keep going for the next three to four months, and so we gotta kind of account for that. So we've increased all of our fix and flip returns to 16 to 20%. If it's a 20% deal, it ends up being more of like about a 60% cash on cash return. So let's look at why this is okay for recessions. 
and if the market's coming down. So here's a deal, like this is a normal deal that we would have been selling. You could buy it for 500, your rehab costs were 125 and you're gonna sell this thing. Uh, at the end of the day, you were gonna sell it for 775,000, which was gonna give you about a return, of, that was gonna be about a 13% return on cash, which equated out to a 37% return on cash on cash with leverage. Uh, so that's with a 13%. The second box over here is with a 18.5% uh, a, a margin in there. So as you can see in this, these two scenarios, we got 500 with the exit of 775, all your holding costs, you have a net profit of $46,000 or 37%. And that's gonna be for a six month deal. And you guys, 37% return in six months is a very good return. I don't care what you guys have may seen for the last 24 months. If you expect the returns you may have seen in the last 24 months, you might as well sit out because that's just not. It's like if you bought Bitcoin a year ago, you crushed. Now, not so much crushing. And it's, but why is it safe? So this market comes down 10% with interest rates, right? And we have not seen that yet. But if it comes down 10%, you are net loss of 3,500 bucks on that deal. If you execute it perfectly. With our new margins that we're in, if it comes down 10%, you're still making 30 grand. And so it pads it out that way. And then what we're also doing is all of our comps, if we're going with a 500 comp, we don't use any comparables, how we pad it, we don't use anything past 30 days sales now. So all of our underwriting team is now going with only 30 day back sales, actives and pendings. If there's more actives in the market, and just one sold in the last 30 and the pendings are less than that sold, we're going with the pending numbers. So we are now comping off actives and pendings. Now, if there is no fixed up comparables, then we're gonna go, we're gonna expand out a little bit and stay with those 30 day sale comps because we have to use data points. Um, so, but as you can see, that's how you protect yourself on a fix and flip. If you make 30 grand and your cash out of pocket's 126, you're still making a 20% return on that deal. So you can pad in that 10% drop and still make a good return. And if it doesn't drop 10%, then you're just hitting the numbers the right way at that point. And so that's why we've adjusted. We didn't just adjust it to 18 to 20 based on like, hey, this is my gut. It was based on the math. This supports a 10% drop. If we see a 10% drop in six months, that's not very good. That's kind of what we were seeing back in 2009 at that point. So that's how we are underwriting everything on that point. On long-term holdings, the pivot. So what we're doing for like the Burr method, right? Everyone wants to do the Burr method. Why? Because you buy a good deal, you refinance all your money back out and your cash flow and you own this asset with 25% equity. That's a great thing. One problem is right now is the rates are making it very hard to do that to make it cash flow, but they are out there. Um, and so what we're doing with our long-term holdings and how we're looking at every deal now is we're looking at the forecasted rate, not the buy it now rate. If we're buying on a Burr, like today, rates are at 8%. When we go, or they were at, no, we had, Jason Zang said 7.5% with the buy down? 7 plus points. Yeah, 7, yeah, 7% plus points, or you can kind of get in the middle at 7.5. And so, uh, like right now, if we have a six month project, we're gonna add another half point to that rate at that point. Or a three month, we're gonna add a half point. And if it's like a nine month deal, cause like the burrs I buy are usually really beat to hell, I'm gonna actually add a point into my exit. So when I'm looking at my cash flow, I'm adjusting for what the Fed's telling me down the road. Now I'm gonna start scaling that back if the Fed comes out and goes, hey, this is my three quarter hike and I think we're good for the rest of the year, then I'm gonna keep it at par. So again, that's why it's so important to listen to these conversations that they're having. Um, we're adding construction contingencies to our budgets. Uh, and then also we're just asking for better terms now. We don't need to ask for cash close offers on rentals if it's beat up. We can get longer terms, get creative on our financing, look at different deals. I know Jen just got like, we had a really good deal on a fourplex that justified using hard money, but then the rates started getting all whacked out as we're in feasibility. We renegotiated the seller to give us a 45 day close with a conventional loan because it saved the cost for the client and then the deal looked great at the end of the day. You know, and so you can get better terms. So as you're looking at, uh, you know, rental properties, you wanna get qualified with all your financing people. Get qualified, we have a couple different mortgage brokers we work with, guys. We like them because they know how to evaluate your guys' books well and know how to give you good information. Use whoever you want, these guys are just good. Talk to your local banks, find out where you can get your financing from, what their financing box is, and then work it backwards. Um, and then tar uh, cash flow target areas. 
So what we, our cash flow that we're gonna target now is above inflation, that is our goal. We wanna beat inflation because we know that there's not gonna be appreciation in this market right now. We're gonna see a little bit of depreciation. But if we are cash flowing above inflation, you're winning right now because right now you guys are losing money every day with the money in your account. And that's not gonna slow down for another year. So if you have 100 grand in your account, by the end of the year, or by the end of 12 months, you're gonna have about 90,000 left for value-wise. That's a bad return for you guys. Which, so what I'm doing, I know for me, I'm getting a lot of liquidity over the next six, uh, no, over the next 45 to 60 days, I have a lot of liquidity coming in with some sales of some properties. I'm already looking, I talked to Jan, I'm like, I need to buy these types of properties because I don't wanna sit in the bank losing money. I wanna get it in, in something that this holds. In addition to, now you can buy good product with good upside for good pricing. Like L zone, you know what people don't want right now is development sites. You can get a triplex on and put four townhomes on it down the road and buy it for a normal price rather like an SF, like a single family price rather than the development price. And so those things are how you can make a, a, a ton of wealth. And so what we're really looking at, we call it the 2X rental plan. So we're targeting properties that cash flow higher than inflation. You're beating inflation, that's a win at that point. We are banking on a two year hold. So any rental that I have that I'm buying, I'm planning to minimum, usually I keep them longer than two years, but I'm gonna keep them for two years. The reason being is this is the plan that I'm at least putting into play. It's strategic wealth. So right now you can buy a property with reduced returns at the high rates. I mean, it's not even that reduced, right? Inflation is at 8.6, so you gotta get a 9% cash flow deal. 9% cash flow seems pretty good and those are out there. But like, here's a deal that we just tied up on market. So these are numbers that we're getting right now. Whereas it's a house you can buy for 300, and I'll show you why this, this is good to look at these properties. You buy for 320, it needs, I put 25, John says nothing, but I call him a liar. Uh, it's, uh, I put 25 in, just put 25 in. The value is definitely worth 425 with the reduced scope of work. It's worth 475 as a flip. Okay, so it actually works as a flip too. That's usually go hand in hand. Rents are 2850, which seems excessively high, but we have three rental comps. And you guys, rents do, usually in times of inflation and recession, rents are gonna start creeping up, right? Because rents have jumped. They jumped 30% in the last 18 months. But they were also substantially lower than owning a home right now and there's still a lot of runway there. So this is off market. This isn't even at um, what, what, with any kind of appreciation. In. But right now, after everything, you're gonna leave roughly 58,000 in the deal. You're gonna cash flow. Sorry, I'm trying to get to the slide. Can't see it. I gotta move this thing around. So after everything, you're gonna net out 449. So you're gonna buy it with hard money. You're gonna do the repairs. You're gonna refi it into a loan. We have the rate at seven and a half percent because we're at seven right now. So we added a half point to it. That's gonna give us a 9% cash on cash return, which beats inflation. Okay, that's $500 a month in cash flow. So that's a great return. You get a beat inflation for two years. You got a uh, rental house, doesn't need that much work. You picked up the equity spread. Now, let's say the equity goes down. Well, whatever, it goes down. You're not selling it now anyways. But if it doesn't go down, then you're picking up the equity spread as well. But then after two years, right? So historically for investment properties, we're gonna be around four and a half to 4.75 on the rate when you go to refi. We ran our calcs at five and a half. So we're running all of our, our refis at five and a half. So in two years, because what's gonna happen? The Fed says they're gonna jack up rates as soon as inflation drops and the labor market gets fixed and they're anticipating the end of next year at that point. So that's in roughly 18 months, they're gonna start bringing rates back down because according to them, everything should be under control, which sounds about right to me. They were saying like six months. I'm like, this is longer than six months. So once you refi into a 5.5% rate, then your cash flow almost doubles to 844. And for the last three years, who's been able to buy a 20% return cash flow rental property in our market? Nobody. Not exist, you can't do it. I mean, every once in a while you could. Like if you got the right burr and you left no money in, then you're gonna get it, but your cash flow sucks. But like, it just wasn't there. So that's how you can make wealth really quick. So if you pick up 
two, three properties, and all of a sudden you're making 20% return in, th on, in three years plus the equity position, that's how you build wealth, not income. And that's what, so that's where we're pivoting to, right? Like I was doing a lot of fix and flip and a lot of development sites the last two years because that's where the money was. Now this is where the money is. And it's not that there's not money in flips and all these other things, but as I'm looking as an investor, if I'm trying to get down to financial freedom, stop working as much, this is how I do that. And I haven't been able to do that for the last two years, so this is where it is. So the deals still work with the high rates. And actually, for, even with low rates, where we're getting 10% return deals, very, very rarely. Nope. Not for a light fixer. And so even though the rates suck, the cash flow is better, if that makes sense as long as you're looking at the right deal. So other investment engines. So if you wanna sit on the sidelines, there's other things you can do as a real estate investor, or you can sit on the sidelines. And you guys, again, there's nothing wrong with that. If you're super nervous, you don't, you should never be too nervous to buy an investment or don't buy it. It's just not smart. It, it's gonna make you make bad decisions. So if you're not ready, I encourage you to sit on the sidelines, but there is other things that you can do too. You can get a little bit more passive, right? You can go in and like for me, I don't want my money getting eroded by inflation. That I definitely know because I have a lot of my money even sitting in interest funding, which pays me a pretty good yield, but it's barely keeping me up with inflation. And so, you know, like for me, I just want to make sure my principal is not getting diluted. Like protect my principal is always the concern. So syndications, that's gonna give you an average of a 15% IRR. There's joint ventures, fix and flips. You guys, if you are getting smashed on your construction costs and you're like, I have the money, but my teams just are not performing well, you can partner with a general. Give up some equity in your project. Let them run it. That's gonna get it done faster and on budget. Maybe you make it less stressful, you give up more return, but you give them 20% of the deal. Have them do it for cost plus five, 10%, and 20%. That way they're vested in that deal. So there's other ways you can do it to minimize your risk too. Um, and then short-term notes too. You can always lend out, like if you, if, you know, if you don't wanna take all the risk on, you can make a way less return and lend the money out as well. So there's other things you can do. And then there's lots of opportunities on the rise. You guys, right now, fix and flip, we're already getting our numbers down. Like it's like we're pounding down numbers from where they were. And we're not going to sell anything unless it hits that return. Uh, small multifamily. You guys, the perception from real estate investors is cost of money is too much. There's no point in buying right now. That makes no sense. It's, all, again, all about the performa. So we're seeing a huge opportunity. Like, Jen, how many properties have you seen recently that have been? So many. So, and good neighborhoods with good zoning. That we have not seen in the last two years. No, and, we, and we're not, and you guys, we're also hitting them low, too. So we're, we're, we're hitting them pretty low, but there's good opportunities there. You, and th that was the worst asset class the last two years. Like trying to buy a two to four unit rental property was, a, it was just non-existent. Or the, it wasn't for investors like us trying to build wealth. It was for passive people. Uh, development upside, you guys, things, that's where you make your wealth. What is worth more down the road? What's gonna be up zoned? RSL was a really hot commodity for the last 12 months or 24 months, developers were paying a premium for it. Guess what they figured out? Because costs are so high, costs them nearly double to build a dadu than it does a single family house, and they all pulled out of RSL immediately at that point. That means there's a bunch of shitty, excuse my language, fucked up houses with good upzone that are great for rental properties that you can sit on, wait for them, sell them when the cottages come back. Like those are, I think RSL is gonna be one of the best ones to go after. Uh, also too, because you, if you want, you can always, per the permitting is in five months, so you can permit a site and let it sit there and sell it permitted later down the road. And then just larger walk-in margins. We don't have to buy at 12% anymore. It's just not there. You can buy bigger deals, you just gotta make sure your, your plan is, uh, is uh, put, you got the right plan. So what we're gonna do now, because I've been talking for probably too long, is we're gonna open it up for questions for the room, online, uh, but for more information, guys, you guys, what we've been trying to do over the last 12 months is get more information out to people. A lot of it's been about construction because it's been such a nightmare. So now we're going back into more investing, but you know, we do have a lot of different social media channels. Check them out. We put out a lot of information. We also, uh, I'm on a podcast at Bigger Pockets called On The Market. And all we do is track trends. And, and it's actually really cool. I'm, I'm happy to be on that because the people I talk to are all from different industries. They're all very smart people. And they bring in a lot of guests that I was, like we interviewed uh, uh, the, the financial editor for the Wall Street Journal. 
And he's the one that told me about all this stuff on the Fed that I would have never known without talking to him. And I'm like, holy shit. He's the one that basically told me he, they're slamming us into a recession on purpose. And I was like, okay, why? And then he explained why. And I'm like, okay, this makes sense and why it could be a good thing. So, um, but definitely check us out on those. Again, educate yourself, guys.